Here at Energy Media, we're very interested in the rate of adoption for electric vehicles, particularly where on the adoption S-curve is the inflection point for adoption for EV sales. So we're going to talk to Colin McCarricker, who is the head of transport analysis for Bloomberg NEF. So welcome to the interview, Colin. Thanks, Markham. Good to be here. Now, I'm very interested to, to talk to you today because I think Bloomberg NEF is considered to be the authoritative uh, analysis on EV sales and, and adoption. So what's your take on where we're at with the, uh, with the inflection point, the tipping point as it's often known? Yeah, I think we're, we're very close and in some segments and in some parts of the world, we're, we're already there. So one of the things that you, as somebody who's looking at the outlook and looking at the data really constantly, one of the things you realize is that the global picture across all vehicle classes and countries hides a huge amount of variation, right? So what we're seeing right now is that in a few regions, say the Nordics uh, in Europe, those are already past the tipping point. You're already getting pretty high levels of adoption. Now you're getting that mostly because of very favorable policies making the economics quite good, right? So when we try and say, when does that happen globally? What we're essentially asking is, when does the technology cost curve give you the same effect that policy interventions are giving you today in those leading markets. And when you're talking about general passenger vehicle sales, our modeling around battery prices and vehicle economics, say that comes around 2024 or 2025, but that's also there's also a lot of variation by individual vehicle classes. So two-wheeled vehicles are already, they're already well on their way. You're already at 20, 30% market share uh, because of China really, but and, and but picking up in places like India. Buses as well, you're also getting pretty high levels of adoption now of new e e electric new bus sales. When you come to passenger vehicles, there is a variation between say the biggest vehicles and the smallest vehicles and, and, and those tipping points vary by country and segment. But generally around 2025 is when you start to see most of them starting to go in our models. What's your take on the recent spate of announcements by big automakers that they're all in on electric and by 2030, maybe 2035, and are committing tens of billions of dollars to, to this transition? Uh, does that change your view on where the inflection point is and what that curve uh, looks like going forward? It does. And this has been something we've been trying to model and understand, right, is that for a lot of automakers, it's very hard to maintain multiple drivetrain technologies, right? Um, because those are expensive, you have these big multi-year, even decade long uh, cycles around developing a new vehicle architecture, and then you use it across as many vehicles as you can to, to amortize that cost. You can only have so many of those vehicle architectures of different powertrain technologies going at the same time. And that's why you see some of the smaller automakers. So most recently, Jaguar, Volvo saying, look, we're, we're going all the way there. I think 2025 for Jaguar, 2030 for Volvo, all electric sales from then onwards. Um, some of the bigger ones, like say Volkswagen, the really high volume producers, Volkswagen or GM, uh, a bit later, Volkswagen now saying 70% of sales in Europe will be battery electric by 2030. GM saying globally aiming for 100% by 2035 uh, without a tailpipe. So they're leaving the options open a little bit on what that looks like. But I think you can sort of understand it through that lens is that once you get to a certain point, why would you throw more R&D money after a segment that's clearly declining when you can throw money after a segment that's clearly growing? And in our view, and this was a bit controversial when we said it three years ago, sales of internal combustion engines probably peaked, internal combustion engine vehicles probably peaked in 2018 and are now in permanent decline. We don't see them recovering from the pandemic. And even if the pandemic can happen, they were declining the two years before that. So I don't think you get to a point where you have more internal combustion engine vehicles sold in the world than you had in 2017 and 18. And that really starts to filter into some of the automaker strategies. So if anything, I would say when we talk about tipping points, um, there, there's still room for significant acceleration over what we're saying there because of uh, those efforts from automakers and also because the costs on their internal combustion engine vehicle platforms are going up, not down. It costs more and more to make those vehicles comply with fuel economy regulations. Let's talk about another potential accelerator of sales and that changes to battery technology. I've had the interview, uh, I've interviewed your colleague, James Frith, who's head of uh, battery storage at Bloomberg NEF. And he's talking about uh, a very significant decline in costs 
We're also seeing some manufacturers talk about the introduction of new chemistries like solid state as early as 2025. And I think the, uh, the general feeling is that battery technology is changing faster than people had anticipated. What, what role does that play in your forecast? Yeah, I mean, this is something we've been working on for 10 years now, trying to understand how battery chemistry is, is going to change. And um, we've always had a more aggressive view on price declines than most, or really than anybody else in the industry, and it's still been lower than, than we thought. So um, that always tells us we need to go back and check all of our assumptions and see what we're getting right and getting wrong. I think one of the things you have to remember is just how different the, the financial picture is for pursuing new battery technologies today than it was a few, even a few years ago. So the amount of funding flowing into the sector on the technology development side has never been anywhere near as high as it is right now. And that naturally probably will accelerate some of the timelines for newer technologies. But it's also worth keeping in mind that there is a bit of lock-in to the current technologies that we have. There's a huge amount of capacity being built right now that is pretty optimized for the current generation of technology. So even when we see the first, say, solid state batteries working their way into vehicles, maybe it's 2025, maybe it's give or take a few years, it'll still take a long time before that's taking over the whole market. So I think that is kind of the balance you have to strike is recognizing that the technology has never been moving so fast as it is now, while also recognizing that the prices for the majority of batteries in the market will actually still be set with technology that looks very similar to today. So I think that's that's one of the things we're trying to balance off in our thinking is, yes, you can get the vehicles out, you can get the batteries out there, you can get them into vehicles, but if they're just at the highest end vehicles, you've still got several years before they start to make an impact on mass market pricing. And that's something we're always trying to balance out as well. Well, let's talk about another important uh, variable here, and that is policy. And we've had a, a number of very significant policy announcements lately. And of course, the election of Joe Biden in the US would have to be ranked right up there at, at the top. Uh, his Secretary of Energy, uh, Jennifer Granholm, has made it very, very clear that the US wants to become the leader in EV technology and manufacturing by 2030. What role will uh, that renewed emphasis on policy around EVs play into your forecast? It has a huge impact, and this is a really important distinction that's sometimes hard to, to, to make very clear, is that we are not forecasting election results, right? So when we do our forecast last year, we're saying, what is the current policy picture out there in the world right now? And what we're not doing is saying, I think Donald Trump is going to win the election, um, or I think Stacey Abrams is going to be a significant enough force in Georgia to organize enough voters to control to, 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 to dramatically change the, the legislative landscape in the US. Of course, those things do influence the forecast. Um, so what I would say is that all of our forecasting currently assumes that the current policies in place remain in place until the end of their lifetime. But when a big policy changes, Joe Biden getting elected, if he tightens CAFE, corporate average fuel economy regulations in the US, and Canada will probably follow, um, and, and obviously he signaled very strongly that he will, then that does increase the outlook in our forecast. And similarly, it looks like the European Commission is going to tighten the vehicle CO2 standards for Europe for 2030. And we've done a fair bit of analysis on different scenarios for that. And it looks like the, the, the tightening that they will do would probably require more than 50% of vehicle sales in Europe to be plug-ins by 2030, and maybe even higher than that, depending on what they land on. That'll come out in around June or July. So these things are, are significant accelerants. China committing to net zero in 2060 is also a significant accelerant. So one of the things we're doing this year is to try and say, what does a net zero trajectory look like for road transport? And what is the base case trajectory that we're on? Because increasingly these policy announcements are designed to try and bridge the gap between the two. Right? Most of the economic output in the world is in countries that have committed to a net zero target, a long-term either 2050, 2060 net zero target. So the gap between the current trajectory and what you need to be on to hit that trajectory becomes a more and more important question, because I think you'll see more and more policy aimed at closing those gaps in the subsequent years. So that's something I think we need to do a better job of communicating of what the base case is uh, and what it is not. I interviewed an analyst uh, a few weeks ago who argued that uh, Europe, China, in particular China, and North America are now in a technology arms race. And uh, electric vehicles and batteries are a really key part of that arms race. What's your uh, view on that? 
been so sorry there's just a bit of construction noise in the back hopefully it doesn't last so i think we are in a bit of an arms race on on battery technologies and on the supply chain um i i do think that it's early days on that though too i also see a lot of groups sort of writing off the us or saying china's won this this is the very beginning of a multi-decadal shift um, when you really look at how long it takes to change over the fleet and all the charging infrastructure we're going to need and the technologies to integrate those vehicles with the grid, there is still a lot of opportunities here and there's still a lot to play for. And it is a big element of industrial and trade policy that is going to be um, sort of fought over between, between Europe and, and North America and, and, and parts of Asia, I think, as well. Any final thoughts, Colin? One of the things I would say is we've been doing this for quite a while now, looking at the outlook, and we've seen more and more groups raise their forecast and now kind of more and more groups saying a similar thing that we're saying on, on mass EV adoption. I think one of the areas that there's two areas that I see that still have some unsolved issues on them. One of them is on probably on the raw material supply chain side. So there's going to be enough battery manufacturing capacity in the world, enough car manufacturing capacity. It does take longer to get uh, new raw material mining capacity online. So there's a potential bottleneck coming in there. The other one is around charging infrastructure. So most cars charge at home. Most people can charge at home uh, 80, 90% of the time. Even. But if we're really going to electrify all of transport, all of road transport, um, you do need a pretty significant build out of public charging infrastructure. I think the move to electric is inevitable, but it's not inevitable that it will be equitable. And I think that is increasingly going to be the focus over the next 10 years, is making sure that everyone can come, come along on this journey. So I think that's where we'll probably see some of the most interesting stories in the next little while around business models for charging infrastructure and integrating electric vehicles onto the grid and around extraction processes um, and refining processes for some of the raw materials that are going to enable this transition. Colin, thank you very much. Really appreciate this. Thanks, Mark. Good to speak to you.